show, which we do every few weeks, uh, and, and uh, deal with subjects of interest, uh, sometimes from a progressive or liberal point of view, uh, and sometimes from other issues. But today, we're going to do something a little different, uh, a little different for us. Uh, we think <coughs> it'll be fun. My program guest, Hap Ziegler, uh, who is an attorney and a consultant, and I are going to try this. Uh, what we want to do is look at some of the public comments that locals have made over the last few weeks in the media um, and maybe have a, a, a little fun with some of them, uh, look at what people say uh, and, what, and, and how they sound when they're in print, and, um, and maybe we'll cover some of the more topical issues uh, that are also of, of interest in Santa Barbara and our local community that way. Uh, if this works, we might do it again. Uh, Happy, you ready to go? I'm ready. Okay, here's the first uh, shot uh, over, the, over the bow. This is a letter that uh, was, was uh, sent uh, from Vandenberg Village to the local newspaper. And I'm going to read this uh, mostly in, uh, incomplete because I think it's a really interesting. The author says, as to my contempt for the attention given to PTSD, let me count the ways. First and foremost, it takes attention and care away from men and women who have sustained grievous life-altering injuries in combat. These truly heroic wars deal with their traumatic experiences. Few of the PTSD crowd ever have a scratch on them. Even fewer have ever been near content, content, combat. PTSD stories and the media strain the hard-won image and reputation of the U.S. Armed Forces. They boost the morale of the Muslim enemy. Have you ever noticed that we never hear of PTSD problems among any of the Muslim terrorist groups. Have you noticed that, Hap? I have noticed. Um, For some odd said, reason. Of course, then the uh, author goes on and makes some reference to what he calls POSD, which is the post-Obama stress disorder. Uh, and I don't even understand how that is related to his first uh, uh, hypothesis. But what do you think about this, uh, this rant, Hap? Do you think this person was serious, or is this sarcasm? I... I would hope that it was sarcasm, but I'm afraid the man from Vandenberg Village was serious, uh, which is kind of shocking. It is shocking for him to uh, 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 say that people who have suffered post-traumatic stress disorder, a disorder that has been identified in every major war, at least since the Civil War, the Red Badge of Courage, uh, novels and literature of those days up through World War I, Ernest Hemingway's experiences and stories. Exactly up through World War II with Joyce and all the people who wrote about World War II and the soldiers who were traumatized by the war to this present moment, we've experienced this idea that there's a psychological <coughs> consequence of combat and, and even being in threat. And for this person to ridicule it is stunning to me. It, it's, it's amazing to me. And the fact that he says, few have a scratch on them and fewer have been near combat. Right, the implication being is, if you don't actually have a ble bleeding wound, you're not, you're not really injured. Correct. And there are so many documented stories of how these folks come back from being on the front line and being traumatized. Well, now, that's not to say, could, could you or I, if we tried hard enough, find somebody who's working the system? Sure. Well, of course, but that's not But I'm easy. sure some people in sure. Vandenberg Village is working the system, too. <laughs> I suspect that may be true. Uh, but to throw out uh, uh, all these uh, traumatically distributed, <clears throat> and, and also to deny the, uh, the emotional and, and, and personal cost of war is what he seems to be doing. He wants us, you, you know, this, this uh, and, then, and then to go into this rant against President Obama uh, and to associate these two ideas, which I guess the two ideas are that People who claim PTSD are phonies, uh, and there's no real reason for them to be doing it because the Muslims don't do it, <laughs> which is I mean, absurd. I mean, how this person could even begin to know whether there's trauma, psychological trauma in the enemy's uh, camp is, is beyond me. Or, or that it would be reported to us. Yeah, it would be known to us. Uh, yeah. Is, uh, is it, and I'll, you know, so anyway. So, okay, well, there's, there's a start. That's the kind of thing that... Uh, one of our Santa Barbara County residents felt was uh, worthy of, um, of putting together. Um, you got something along those lines, Hap? I have one that's, that's interesting. Uh, there was, <coughs> pardon me, apparently a couple letters. I got the 
the second letter. And the second letter was from somebody in Montecito that said they couldn't help but read that some poor soul insisted that 10,000 scientists couldn't be wrong. He's talking about global warming. He said, could this poor soul refuse to simply accept this realism that everything is just fine? He goes on to talk about what the facts are. The fact is the Earth is not one degree cooler today than it was 20 years ago. Of course, that's not exactly correct. Well, it's warmer. <clears throat> the fact is that the whole global warming computer model was created by an entity that ha was agenda-oriented. Mm -hmm. And the fact is if you follow the money, stay with me on this, will you, Glenn? Yeah, if I you wanna, follow I'm, the I'm, money, I'm, my mind is on the money right now. You will quickly find that these charlatans, such as our former vice presidents, are making millions professing the calamity. Mm -hmm. So then he goes on to explain that American Sniper says it all. Oh, the movie, the American, movie Sniper. American Sniper. Well, you know, I haven't caught said, that yet. But there, are, there are three different kinds of people. There are the flock, there are the wolves, and there is the shepherd. The wolf is out to see what he can get from the flock. The shepherd protects the flock. The poor soul who believes that global warming is part of our flock. Our political left is clearly the wolf. He... He sets himself up mm -hmm. as a shepherd, mm -hmm. as are others. Well, before, when I read that, I pulled this aside for this particular meeting, but a fellow from, I think it's a fellow, from Santa Barbara, can't tell from the name, wrote, read, he read that same one, and he said, obviously the, writing is, the writer is kidding along the lines of your original question. Possible. And he said, while it's true that certain people will shamelessly exploit a single situation, that small percentage does not negate the whole situation. He <laughs> goes on to say, if this person, the person from Montecito, were serious, this writer says, I'd be curious as to his source that shows that 97% of climate scientists got together to decide to form a vast conspiracy to deceive the flock. And, in, and all these climate scientists who are being, um, who are somehow coordinated like a bunch of cats, I don't know how you're gonna get them all together in one place anyway and get them to agree, but they have some economic incentive in doing this, which is re their reports, the fact they get to go to conferences or something. Uh, yes. uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the fantasy of these people, this sort of magical thinking that we're all being lied to by, by those who want to trick us and that uh, everything is going to just be fine if we ignore these uh, people who know. You know, not one of these people would think that somebody's lying about the way their car works, you know, or the way the airplane flies when they take a jet airplane trip. Right. Not one of these people think it's just magic that keeps that alive, or a lie, or a conspiracy. Right. So science is okay for them when they like it, but, <laughs> exactly. but, but, but science, when, it, uh, when it's inconvenient for them to uh, face, you know, m March, Los Angeles, I saw this in the LA Times a few days ago. The, the month of March in Los Angeles was almost three degrees warmer on average than any month in recorded history of March in Los Angeles. We're not talking about incremental uh, a tenth of a degree or half a degree. Mm -hmm. Almost three degrees warmer right. than it had been for 150 years of record keeping. To deny this and deny what, that, the, that the spring is moving north in the northern hemisphere every, every, every year, is, it comes earlier and earlier, farther and farther north. Correct. We experienced that here in Santa Barbara. Oh, and this and, year. yeah. And for these people, just to hold on to their hopes that this is just a lie, in order to and not do anything about the actual problem is scary. Agreed. This this uh, person again, who was a rebuttal to the crazy person, mm -hmm. uh, said that anyone can use Google to find anything they want to be true. Sort and of find true. a document to support sort of it. <laughs> but that doesn't make it so. That's right. <laughs> which is what yeah. he says right I here. I had a college professor that wrote on the back of my news, uh, one of my uh, papers, um, Mr. Maurer, just because you say it so doesn't make it so. <laughs> I've always remembered that comment. Yes, I've, I, I've had some judges write that on my briefs. <laughs> <laughs> but here's one that, uh, that I enjoyed. This is a, a news press uh, uh, letter uh, from a guy in Santa Barbara. I'm going to read this one, too, because it's sh short. It says, water, one year left, because the drought is going to be a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on about the drought, right? One year left in California. That was the headline of the news press and on the Internet. 
yet we continue to release water from Lake Kachuma to preserve a few trout. <laughs> Can someone with a modicum of sense stop this insanity? The trout are not endangered. The ranchers and the farmers are. I, I, you know, this one has so many, in, in that short two, set, two paragraphs, this writer has so many false pieces of information that it's stunning for me to even begin. Let's start with one, which is the water that's being released is partly to keep the trout uh, or steelhead or whatever you want to call them uh, uh, available. Alive, yeah. It's part of the environment of our society, but that water goes into the ground basin. It's, re it's, it's released specifically for the purpose of re replacing water in the aquifers so that the downstream uh, users, the farmers and the ranchers that he's talking about along that river, San Inez River, all the way almost to Lompoc, almost to the river ocean, can get water out of their wells. I mean, this person doesn't even understand that. This is aquifer replenishment. But it's easy to say that we're, that these liberal agenda to save some fish is, is, is what this is all about. The second thing is the amount of water released is such a, uh, it's almost like a cup of water in a restaurant. I mean, it's such a de minimis uh, amount compared to the total water problem that it's hardly worth, I mean, it's symbolic maybe. But be careful with that analogy. They, of course, are asking us not to have a glass of water. Well, I always get water in the restaurants. <laughs> and if, I, if, if possible, I pour it in a plant, potted plant on the way out. Okay. But anyway, this, this is the kind of thinking. I mean, I, I don't know if these, if these writers are having fun with us, uh, pulling our leg, or what. But, you know, they don't take the time to research the issue that they're complaining about to find anything. Uh, whether what they're, they're, they just want to believe that if we didn't put water in the little creek, on, in the little Hilton Creek there off the San Inez River, we'd all have green lawns or something. Sad, yeah. sad. Yeah, it is sad. It, it's, uh, it's, this is an interesting session, Glenn, in the sense yeah. that all these people can, I don't know if they do, but they can vote. Well, this is democracy, and, and that's okay with me because we've got some people on our side that say th things that I find somewhat equally untenable. Well, moving, moving to a different side, mm -hmm. uh, I have a letter here from March 26th, actually from somebody in Phoenix, Arizona, but written But they as, felt they could write a commentary on Santa Barbara. Yeah, but it was a good commentary because he's replying to a March 12th letter which headlined ISIS, I-S-I-S, -I -S, the, the splinter group over in mm -hmm. the Mideast, is definitely Islamic. So this person is responding to that article. I got that other article. And he said, the writer says the, the Islamic terrorist is an accurate term because they call themselves the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Well, of course they call themselves <laughs> that. Yeah, I mean, that. They, they, they're trying to understand and have a basis for their thuggery and uh, vulgarity. He says, this letter is good, he says, by regurgitating their spacious claims of religious direction, these co-conspirators, that is the people that call them uh -huh. Islamic terrorists, are nothing more than recruitment tools for the terrorist cause. It was interesting that the, the March 12th letter, the writer said, well, of course they're all Muslims. One of the leaders holds a PhD in Islamic studies. <laughs> I, and, I, I saw that. And many of the people in the army pray five times a day. This, this, this letter is in response or an a, yes. a attack. It's the Tea Party kind of attack toward, they claim that uh, President Obama refuses to call Muslims terrorists. Right, that's what uh, it's about. And, and that's what these things are about. Right. And, and, and their answer to that, their intellectual uh, exhortation on this subject is they call themselves Islamic State. Number one, they don't call themselves ISIL. That's a Western, uh, in some places they're called Daesh, in some other places they're called other names. But, without, but anyway, just because you call yourself a Christian, let, let's say the white Christian councils of the South who are out killing black people, uh, uh, is that evidence that the Christian believers are racist and murderers? Well, several things. First of all, I thought it was fairly good. This fellow from Arizona said the fact that they have a PhD and they fought, pray, pray five times a day, what about the pedophile priests? <laughs> they have degrees, and they probably pay more than five well. times a day. How about the organized crime members? 
that go to church every Sunday and then go out and do what they do. Yeah. And this, this, I thought, was a great concluding line. Using the word Islamic in this context, that is the context Obama mm -hmm. says we shouldn't, is both a compliment to the terrorists that has given them legitimacy that there's some religion behind what they're doing when they're actually gangsters and thugs, and a grievous insult to 1.5 billion Muslims who are not like this. Well, that was a reasonable letter, uh, trying to bring some sanity back into the balance in that. In that. But the other person who wrote the, uh, the other letters, letter, there's another one that came along that I happen to see also, I have some notes on, where uh, this, this insightful letter uh, said that um, ISIS um, was uh, not preparing to invade Italy. Yes, we I have that. that one too. I and have um, that one. and uh, what's going to happen is they're going to burn down Rome, they're going to destroy the Vatican, <laughs> they're going to hold the Pope for Haas ransom, and then, of course, the White House will cater to them. The White House will then be able to cater to them and negotiate with them. My advice to ISIS if they're planning on invading, this was apparently based on some. A uh, guerrilla group in Algeria that made a threat to come across the, Channel, the Mediterranean. Uh, my advice would be that they that they don't go over the Alps. <laughs> you know, don't use elephants to go across the Alps, a la Hannibal. Exactly. Uh, but uh, you know, th th these kind of uh, horse tactics are a little scary. Uh, well, that, that on that same article that was from Galita, by the way, on uh, March 30th, and it, it says ISIS prepares to attack Italy. Yeah. Well, I did some research to find out, and of uh, yeah. course, there's nothing except in the wacko oddballs on the internet about ISIS preparing to invade Italy. ISIS did come out and say they would love to go to the Vatican and destroy all the Christian mm. monarchs. And of course, this person says, hopefully the White House will develop programs to meet their legitimate grievances and perhaps give them jobs flipping hamburgers. Perhaps Lois Capps can come up with a non-militaristic solution. Thank God we have the White House and Lois Capps making some of these decisions for us and not wackos here that would go to war because somebody said they'd like to go right. to the Vatican and destroy the Christian icons. But, but, the, but the common theme on these uh, is they always want to bring it back to President Obama's alleged <laughs> failure to defend America from these foreigners, these right. the, not not just foreigners, but non-Christian, you know, and they're, they're the same people that often say that this is a Christian nation and all that, and this is part of their evidence of that. Let me move on to a different sure. di different direction here because I think the 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 uh, one of the one of the interesting thematics of the last few weeks has been this idea: of what to do about the drought? And uh, here's one guy who wrote a letter from uh, Galita saying. Uh, the, the drought was uh, caused by the government. Uh, the, the true cause of the drought, he says right here, uh, it, it, uh, but not one of them mentions the true cause of the problem, government at all levels. And I got thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, this is provocative, it's interesting. Well, actually, I'm not sure I disagree with this guy in some ways, because what he's saying is that government, by tolerating growth, you know, I, I, I sort of thought this was going to be sort of a Tea Party kind of uh, anti-government rant, which there's so often in there, but, but what he is saying is we let more growth, more housing, more businesses, more shops, more shopping centers. And if you've been out to Galita lately and looked at what's going on out there in that Costco area, it's scary to look across the Hollister and see that bank of apartments. It looks like a rat worn to me. It's really scary looking to me. Anyway. Um, is that an architectural term? Uh, rat Warren? Rat Warren should be an architectural <laughs> prohibition. There should be prohibitions on our Rat Warrens in architecture. Anyway, so here's here's a guy who's thing, but, but so, other, so there's some so there's some logic behind it, even though yeah, he's even not, though it uses a provocative idea to make a point. But the other thing right. that I thought was interesting, there's three letters, at least three letters, uh, on this idea that what we need to do is suck up water from someplace else and bring it back to California. Um, sure, that that's easy to do. Yeah, this here's a guy, uh, the first of, of the three. This says, well, I'm not this I'm not a hydrologist. He says. There's almost an unlimited uh, fresh water for the entire state of California that's gone completely untapped. Where that might be? <laughs> Oregon and Washington. I see. Uh, the, or the Columbia River. The Columbia River, I refer to the many rivers from Northern California to the north uh, to dump thousands of feet in the, in the ocean every day. The Columbia River itself could easily donate, I'm sure the people of Oregon, who by themselves are in a serious drought too. 
Not as bad as ours. Not as bad as ours. Two, right. Over three quarters of the state of Oregon is in a major drought. Right. Only the coastal area is not. Uh, they were going to donate that or sell it to us uh, uh, at, at cheap, cheap, cheap rates. And then he says this, which I thought was hilarious. Their daily flow could be could flow to California by gravity, siphon, or pumping. Now, gravity. How is it going to flow to California well, by Glenn, gravity? You're, you're, you're missing the point, Glenn. Have you never seen a globe? Oregon is up from California. Well, I was wondering about that. I saw the map of the West Coast, and I realized it's above us. Exactly. So the water from the Columbia River up here will, by gravity, naturally just flow sure. down to California. Exactly. That's right. Well, I think this may be his idea, and I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the Earth is not flat. Maybe there is, a, you know. Well, again, but, again. The last time I checked, the border between California and Oregon, when you go up that way, uh, or that pass, is about 4,000 feet. At least, yeah. So the Columbia River is at sea level. Where he wants to pick it up at the mouth, and then he's going to ship it up here by gravity or pump. 4,000 well, feet of pumping is going to be a bit of a work. Well, let's see. I, I, I forget where this is from. This is from Santa Barbara. Let me just say one thing, perhaps in defense of this idea. We're putting in pipelines, and there are multiple pipelines. Mm -hmm. We're only hearing well, about one on the Keystone that. Pipeline. Yeah, you're in the and, same page. And would, wouldn't it be better if we were bringing water for right. us to live well, here and you go. Here's oil here. to perpetuate There's the... There's three letters on that, on that guy. Here's one. Oh, okay. One guy says, let's be smart about the drought. A previous letter I spoke about a water pipeline from the north. That was this letter. This guy says, what an obvious idea. Will someone please tell our governor what a great deal this is? But instead, he's spending his money on high-speed rail. <laughs> it's like, so th th these all take a shot at high-speed rail. And I said, we should spend them on a, a water see. pipeline. I see. Uh, we don't, we, and th another one here, we need water more than a train. We should have water. Uh, and the, the money from this pipeline should come from the bullet train. And we should have, uh, and this one here says, uh, piping water from the abundant supply in Columbia River to the headwaters of Sacramento is a doable and cost-effective, this guy says. Well, the amount of energy involved in doing that, I did some research, and, and apparently Rand, Rand uh, was given a, Rand Institute or research people were given this uh, pie in the sky kind of thing. What would, what would it take to make this work? And they were talking about a 33 page, a 33 foot pipe at the mouth of the Columbia River that would float in the ocean. At least it wouldn't have to be pumped up and down. It would be in the ocean. It would be made out of Teflon materials. It would cost somewhat in the neighborhood of Hundred and forty billion dollars. That would be big enough to get a sizable amount down south mm -hmm. that would actually have some effect on California's drought. Wow. Not a four foot oil pipeline, but a thirty three <coughs> foot diameter pipeline. Hundred and forty billion dollars made of Kevlar and it would last for <coughs> at the most a decade. So you're replacing this once every 10 years, you're putting a new $140 billion in to bring water down here. And of course, the people, the people up there aren't going to just stand by and let California suck off their water. It, it, it's an interesting concept, okay, no well, question there, about but it. But here's the, the, the of, of all these, uh, of all these uh, pipeline letters and all that, one I like the best is this one here. I have heard that Governor Jerry Brown is going to allocate $1 billion toward the drought. What's he going to do with the money? This is from Santa Barbara. Why can't we collect all the melting snow and excess water that's in the Midwest and on the East Coast, put it in train cars, ship it out here to a central location, stick it in tanker trucks, put it in our lakes? We could split the cost of shipping the water with each state we deal with it would be win-win. It would help solve their flooding problem and help with our drought. So we're going to dry up their excess rain problem. They're going to lower their lakes and their rivers and their flooded streets. And we're going to put them on trains and bring it to California. Can you imagine? I think that uh, that was written by Harry Potter, right? <laughs> no, another Santa oh, Barbara. Oh, okay. uh, another Santa Barbara. Uh, because I thought it was a magical answer to our problem. So we collect the melting snow. Now I don't know what you do when the snow is melting. When the snow is gone, you have to collect it somewhere. But but I like this this fantasy idea. I like this idea. I can see people out there in Boston when there's 12 feet of snow on the streets of Boston, and they're going to have some pipe there <laughs> waiting for it to melt, and they'll just suck it up and vacuum it up and put it in tanker trucks and ship it to California. So, what do you think? What about that? Well, 
Okay, we got a few minutes left. Let's I, see if we can I get think, into some I think we're missing stuff. one of the big ones. Which is? Well, the uh, Santa Barbara College Art Students oh, the TP. erected a six-sided wood, wooden conical structure decorated with various painted geometric patterns and cutouts and invited people to come and have tea in their TP. TP. Apparently, there are some students who claim some Indi American Indian blood and some teachers that sided with them and took offense to Scott driving it as words like offensive cultural expression without permission, an example of the persistence of white privilege. Now, I happen to be very supportive of people that are I undertrodden. Think, I think you and but I you know, are. I think, you know, I wear my sombrero on Fiesta. Yeah. I don't think I'm making fun of anybody from south of the border. I think that if nothing else, I'm honoring them. Yeah, I, uh, I didn't see any disrespect intended uh, in, in that structure. I didn't and even either. call it a TP is, I mean, I think they call it a TP, but it, the TPs aren't endemic to the aren't a West Coast thing. It's not like Santa Barbara's, the, the native population sure, used yeah, uh, yeah. that kind of housing. Uh, and if the people of the Midwest or the places that did have it find something objectionable about the idea, but I don't know. It, 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 you know, it's not like those fraternities in these coasts that have been doing these, these racist songs or exactly. have these historical traditions exactly. of really obnoxious behavior. We're getting down here, we only have a minute. I want to read one or two lines sure. of stuff because we, Go ahead. as always, it takes a little longer than we thought. Here's a letter from Galita. Uh, and it, it starts off talking about uh, Cruz's birthplace. You know, uh, Senator <coughs> Cruz is not, a, Ted Cruz is not a natural born citizen. He was born in Canada, like some others. I think it's Canada, Cuba or someplace. Anyway, uh, this yeah. guy's worried about whether uh, that is barring him, like, because you know, the Tea Party was worried about Obama. So he wants this. He says, you know, even though Cruz could be a good guy for us, we have to be honest to ourselves and say, no, he's not a properly qualified candidate for president. That's okay. That's an interesting argument. Um, be consistent. But then he goes on and says this last paragraph, which is a little nervous. I also have no doubt that we are going to lose the country. No doubt at all, unless we do what must be done to defeat our treasonous government, whether there be an election or not. Call to arms. It's a call to arms, I guess. And that's why we have the Second Amendment. <laughs> that's exactly why. Okay, so we're almost out of here. But I guess there's a lot more here we could have gotten into, like the, the Mimi Court Golf Course thing, the uh, Board of Supervisors raise. Um, the one guy who votes against the raises and says we all deserve a pay cut, then then Adam uh, uh, decides he'll take it and sees nothing inconsistent with taking the raise. Uh, some some other great quotes, but we're gone. Time is up. Uh, so Hap, thank you for this time. We'll have to As do always, it again. It went a little quicker. I hope the people enjoyed it, and uh, maybe we can do it again with some more of this free humor. I hope it was meant. I hope it was taken with humor. Thanks.